just published on the updated results from the fight trial. Can you tell us a little bit about bemarituzumab, what it targets, and how does it work? So bemarituzumab is an FGFR two B monoclonal antibody, and we published the sort of long term results of the fight trial, which was a randomized phase two trial comparing Fulfox with or without bemarituzumab in patients selected for FGFR two B by virtue of overexpression. Um, some patients are actually selected on the virtue of, on the basis of amplification as well, but the majority were by I, an IHC diagnostic. And uh, there's obviously always two reasons to publish secondary long-term analyses of these studies. The first is more maturity, and, and especially in that kind of study that was sort of changed from a phase three to a phase two midstream because it was placebo controlled, we were able to do that. Um, we did really want to see some more long-term maturity to see if the results held up, which for the most part they did, a few months of Im improvement in overall survival. But perhaps the more important thing was that the biomarker scrutinization aspect um, became more relevant. And, and in the early design of the study and in the even early results of the study, uh, it was felt that a 5% cutoff um, would still have enough separation between the placebo group and the group of patients who got bemrotizumab. But in reality, when we went back and now had the opportunity with a new sponsor, of course, who has new ideas, to scrutinize the biomarker a little more carefully, um, it's really the 10% cutoff that is uh, that distinguishes these patients to a much larger extent. So while there is some uh, advantage to 5% in the group of patients, 5% of FGFR2B staining for bemrotizumab plus Fulfox versus Fulfox placebo, the curves really do separate quite a bit better when mm -hmm. you scrutinize that to 10%. So, um, and that was the main really purpose of that secondary analysis. And how often do you see um, positivity uh, for FGFR2 with a 10% cutoff? It's about 20% of HER2 negative gastric cancer. So the study only enrolled, we don't really know what it would be in HER2 positive, of course, but um, in HER2 negative patients, it's about 20% down from about 30% in the 5% cutoff. So we are um, uh, losing by, de by definition 10% of the patients of eligibility. The importance of that is, as you know, when, when we did the phase three trials, which are ongoing, there's two of them, mm -hmm. uh, one without nivolumab, one with nivolumab, mm -hmm. um, the biomarker was changed from 5% to 10%. And so uh, that had implications for um, numbers, statistics, uh, timelines. So that's um, one of the reasons why this analysis was done in the in this context. But it's still, you're still capturing a pretty significant proportion of patients with this with this agent. And at least the results that you presented thus far um, with this updated analysis are pretty impressive overall survival over two years. Is that is that right? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're having certainly, I, I think actually, you know, we all want to, uh, by definition, all of us in the field like the idea of, of getting better with our biomarkers. So mm -hmm. I think this corresponds to that to some extent. And, and we do have a nice separation of the curves um, at at the point of uh, with the 10% cutoff, which is greater than the original analysis. I think it does make enrollment a little more challenging, obviously, because we have to find we have to find the patients. But we're doing well on the phase three. It's, um, it's enrolling quite robustly. Um, we obviously are now, uh, as I mentioned, there's a without Nevo study, and then there's a with Nevo study, and they're both enrolling globally. So we'll see uh, over the next year or so how those tease out. Um, I yeah. think the, yeah. And I think that the, the nice thing about the design of your studies is also that it allows one cycle of standard chemotherapy before enrollment. This really mirrors what people would do in practice and allows more patients to undergo testing for these biomarker uh, type studies. Um, can you talk just a little bit about adverse events? Corneal toxicity was a big one in phase two. Is there any prophylaxis that built into phase three? And what what is your experience with this? Yeah, so, so corneal toxicity is definitely uh, probably the most 
thing that sticks out at least on the phase two, and it's because of the expression of FGFR two uh, B in particular in corneal epithelium. So um, it, it's uh, in the phase two we we didn't have any prophylactic management, and it was reactive management, and I think. It does help to have prophylactic management. Patients are assigned eye drops and other strategies to help make sure that their eyes are, are not becoming too dry because the real way it manifests clinically for the first time is is dry eyes and, and itchy eyes mm -hmm. and keratitis and things like that. So I think that we, um, by instituting these prophylactic measures, I think it has helped, at least so far as I can tell, and certainly in my patients, but um I, I, it's very important that, you know, the ophthalmologists and the oncologists communicate when you have ocular toxicities, because let's be honest, we're, uh, we're, we're about the furthest holes separated from ophthalmologists as we could be as a medical oncologist. So we've forgotten most of our ocular anatomy by now. So if we're not communicating with them and saying, hey, this is a problem and you have to stop the drug, um, then you know, we could let it go too far. So Right, although we are getting closer and closer to them because a lot of new agents do have ocular toxicities um, with um, antibody drug conjugates. And yes, right. And right. Fine and so it's actually, a little it's... different, right? Because the, mm -hmm. the corneal stuff's a little different than sometimes the retinal stuff. I, and, you know, this stuff doesn't actually impair vision, or at least so far as I can tell, it, it just can make it very disruptive for reading mm -hmm. and for driving and, and itchiness and keratitis is not fun. So um, no, I'm, I'm totally with you. We need to start communicating. We're getting a little closer over the yes. years. Yeah. No, I think it's exciting to see these results, the approach to patients with this disease becoming much more nuanced, many different biomarkers. So hopefully the ongoing phase three trials will allow us to have yet another tool we can use. It will be uh, a bit of a challenge to figure out um, have to incorporate all these new biomarkers and treatments. Any last thoughts on that from you, Zev? I think that's what we're going to spend the next few years uh, dealing with. Oh. So how to how to how to uh, assign biomarker directed therapies. I mean, that's why um, you, you know we really do need to have a better uh, system of getting IHC diagnostics for our patients. I think uh, lung cancer has figured it out a little bit better than we have. We need to probably. Um, have some, instead of doing a la carte IHC testing with different antibodies, we need to come up with some, you know, one yeah. readout of sorts. If we can figure out how to do that, that would be nice. 